reading of God's word is taken from Acts chapter 9, verses 3 to 9. And if you're using the church Bible, this can be found on page 775. Acts chapter 9, beginning at verse 3. As Saul neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. This is the word of the Lord. Morning, everybody. And uh, Faye, thank you very much indeed for sharing that testimony in Family Focus and what an encouragement it is to all of us to get out there and be involved in reading the word one-to-one with other people. Well, do please have Acts chapter 9 open in front of you and I'll ask for the Lord's help as we study his word together. Heavenly Father, it is our joy to worship you together and to bring you the adoration of our hearts and the consecration of our lives. We thank you that you are our Father, that you know us through and through, and that your word is able first to find us, then to speak to us, and then to transform us. And we pray that by your Holy Spirit, this passage will come alive to our hearts and minds this morning. And so we say, speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, you may remember last week we looked at verses 1 and 2 of Acts chapter 9, and we used them as a jumping-off point, didn't we, really, to look at all the other descriptions of Saul of Tarsus, in the New Testament, and we discovered what a monster he really was because he had the blood of Christians on his hands. Uh, He was actually a murderer who had burst into people's private homes and dragged them out and sent them to their death. And it is this man who, within a day or two of meeting the living Christ, became a totally different person. And last week, uh, we said that the kind of the X factor in the transformation of Saul was the mighty power of God. That is the message which Luke brings out very clearly in his account. And it's an important message for you and I to get into our minds because many people today don't believe in the mighty power of God. Uh, You see, what happens is they look at all the horrors in the world around them and they just can't believe that we Christians are on the right track when we celebrate the power of God. Truth to tell, they think we're living in la-la land. But you see, you and I can actually prove the reality of God's mighty power because only God can change human nature. Only God can make evil men into good men. Only God 
can humble proud religious fanatics like Saul of Tarsus. And actually only God can humble our own stubborn and very hard hearts. No human power can do that. And the problem, of course, in South Africa today and in the wider world is that the dark side of man's fallen nature is out of control. And uh, wherever we look in the world today, there are the consequences of our human depravity. And we think to ourselves, you know, if only we could find someone who would change our hearts so that we can become loving and kind and wise. Well, we would vote for that person, wouldn't we? We'd want that person to be our president or our prime minister. We would want that person to have all authority in the world for the duration of our lives. Because, friends, what we really want is not talk. We want power. And we know that no human being can do that. <clears throat> so that's our big theme in Acts chapter 9. It's the mighty power of God in changing human lives. And we're looking at the toughest case of the lot, Saul of Tarsus. There's no one tougher in our world today than Saul of Tarsus. Someone who was, <clears throat> excuse me, constantly breathing out hatred as he tried to murder as many Christians as possible. Now this morning, we're looking at verses 3 to 9, the passage Gillian has just read for us. I guess everybody knows the basic outline of the story. Uh, it's midday. Uh, the sun is blazing down. And all of a sudden, there's a blinding light. Uh, this blinding light is actually brighter than the sun in the sky, if such a thing is possible. And out of this blazing, blinding light comes a voice with an amazing revelation. And we're told that it was Jesus himself, who just a few uh, weeks before had been crucified on the cross. Now, let's get the context here. <clears throat> as far as the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem were concerned, Jesus was a nuisance, he was a problem, he was a threat, and Saul, who was one of the Jewish leaders, assumed Jesus was still in the grave. But now, in a flash, he discovers actually Jesus is not in the grave. He's on the throne of heaven. He's ruling over the affairs of of men and women here on earth. That was a massive shock. And I don't suppose he took in all the dimensions of that uh, all at once. Now, like so many of the miracles that we find in the New Testament, some commentators, some scholars, some pastors can't deal with this. And uh, they try their absolute hardest to come up with an alternative explanation for what happened on the Damascus Road. So one of them very imaginatively says that Saul was suffering from epilepsy. Uh, they say that's what happened to him on the Damascus Road. He had an epileptic seizure. And I didn't know this actually until this week, but apparently some of the greatest names in history have suffered from epilepsy, uh, including Muhammad. Augustine, Julius Caesar, Peter the Great, Napoleon, Blaise Pascal, Rousseau, and Dostoevsky. All those men apparently suffered from epilepsy at some point in their lives. And on the basis that they were great men, in spite of their epilepsy, one particular scholar says this is the key that explains what happened to Saul on the Damascus Road. Now, that is a very weak argument for at least two reasons. First, uh, the writer of this story is the writer of Luke's gospel. And Luke is rightly seen as the most accurate of all the historians writing in the New Testament. And uh, whenever archaeologists today dig up something new in the Middle East, 
what they dig up nearly always confirms what Luke has written down to the tiniest detail. But the second reason that the epilepsy explanation doesn't work is that Luke wasn't just an able historian. By training, by profession, he was a medical doctor. And uh, when he met up with the Apostle Paul, he became his personal physician. And you see, it's because Luke spent so much time with Paul and would have spoken with him many times about these very early days that Luke has such a detailed knowledge and is able to give us this remarkable account of the conversion of St. Paul. And I think it's utterly inconceivable that uh, an able, uh, professionally skilled writer who is also a doctor should tell us not once, not twice, but three times in the book of Acts uh, that this is what actually happened to Paul and that somehow his credibility could be undermined by somebody saying, no, don't believe what Luke's written. Um, It was actually simply epilepsy. Because if that was what happened, well, Dr. Luke would have known about it. He would have told us. So, what did actually happen at noon? Uh, Was it that Saul of Tarsus had this amazing, totally uplifting spiritual experience that's only been given to a very few people, and it gave him a marvelous sense of peace and joy? Well, again, that's what some people think. Because there have been people in history who've had experiences like that. Uh, One of them, for example, is a chap called Sadhu Sunda Singh. Uh, He was a famous Indian missionary in the early part of the 20th century. And for many years, uh, he was one of the pillars of the Christian church in India. Now, Sunda Singh was converted as a teenage boy, having grown up in a pagan anti-Christian home. And he tells the story of his conversion like this. He says that he was praying in the early morning, and he says this, As I prayed, I looked and saw a great light. I looked into the light and saw the form of the Lord Jesus. It had such an appearance of glory and love. If it had been a Hindu incarnation, I would have prostrated myself before it. But it was the Lord Jesus Christ, whom I'd been insulting just a few days before. And I felt that a vision like this could not have come out of my own imagination. I heard a voice saying in Hindustani, how long will you persecute me? I've come to save you. You were praying to know the right way. Why didn't you take it? And then the thought came to me, Jesus Christ is not dead but living. It must be he himself. And so I fell at his feet and I got this wonderful peace which I couldn't get anywhere else. This is the joy I had been looking for, end quote. Now you see, that rather moving story of Sundar Singh can make us think that the apostles' conversion was something rather like that. You know, that it was uplifting. Uh, that he had an amazing sense of the glory of God and of Jesus, and that he kind of went dancing into Damascus to share the wonderful news. But the problem is, that's not what Luke has written. Because the man who goes into Damascus is not dancing, is he? He's broken. He's emotionally on his knees. He's been blinded by the light. He's been utterly, utterly humbled and he has to be led by somebody else into the city. And then for three days, he doesn't eat or drink, so he's not celebrating, is he? He's in the valley. He's come to the very end of himself and he doesn't know which way to turn. Now, why is that? Why is that? Well, it's actually a a vivid illustration of a truth that crops up 
all over the New Testament, which is, and listen to me carefully here, that no one is ever truly converted to Jesus Christ who has not at some point had their pride humbled. It's not actually possible to be lifted up to genuine Christian faith unless at some point the stubbornness and the pride in my heart have been humbled to the dust. And I think that what we're being shown here is that God did this for the great apostle. Now, of course, you and I know uh, that God was planning all along to kind of lift him up to a position of unique authority and importance in world history. But he begins by pulling him down and by humbling him. How does God do it? Well, you can read it in verses 4 and 5. Please have a look at them. It's interesting, we're not given very much detail. Uh, A journalist today would write several books about this. All we're told is that he heard the voice and that twice Jesus referred to Saul persecuting him. Look at verse 4. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Saul replies, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now, as I say, it's a very brief account. There's not very much detail here. And yet twice, Saul hears Jesus say, you are persecuting me. Now, that's very interesting because until this point in his life, Saul thought he was actually persecuting a group of Christians in Damascus. But now he discovers that he's fighting God himself. And there are only two things I want to say to you about this this morning. And the first is this, that to find that you are fighting God is a very alarming revelation. That's how it was for Saul of Tarsus. Uh, After the crucifixion, the resurrection, the ascension, and the coming of the Spirit... We find the apostles, don't we, talking to their Jewish friends, and they're saying things like this. This Jesus has been shown to be the mighty Son of God by miracles and signs. What did you do? Well, you crucified him. Or they might say, God has spoken through Jesus, but you killed him. Now, obviously, that was a very, very unpopular message. And you may remember that it came to something of a climax, didn't it, in Stephen's speech back in chapter 7. Do you remember there that when Stephen was summarizing the history of Israel, he pointed out that whenever God sent them a prophet, they didn't listen. And at the climax of his speech, Stephen says, and you people today are exactly the same. Because when God sent his greatest prophet, Jesus Christ, what did you do? Well, you resisted the Holy Spirit by making Jesus a spectacle of shame on the cross. And you are therefore just like your ancestors. Well, no wonder they took up stones to stone him. And it says, you may remember at the end of that chapter, that Saul of Tarsus was standing there giving approval to his death. I don't know, maybe the reason he was standing there holding the the, the clothing and the coats rather than throwing stones himself was because he was too important to do the dirty work himself. But Stephen, but uh, Saul heard Stephen's speech. And the fact that he approved of his death, and we're told that he did, presumably means that he was furious at Stephen's accusation that He was actually one of those fighting against God. You know, he thought he was defending the truth of God. I mean, after all, he was a respectable senior figure in the synagogue. He'd been trained by the number one rabbi in Jerusalem, a man called Gamaliel. And presumably Saul thought to himself, fighting against God? Me? Me? 
What a horrible accusation. And now as he approaches Damascus, full of pride and full of self-righteousness, the voice from heaven says exactly what Stephen had said. Saul, why are you fighting me? Now today, of course, many people think of God as rather like Father Christmas, as someone whose job is to kind of hand out blessings. He's someone who's never got a problem with anybody. And if that's how you think about God, well, you're never going to be frightened of him. But if you were an Orthodox Jew like Saul, and you've been brought up from childhood to know that God is King of kings and Lord of lords, and that no one can fight against God and win, and that God wins every fight that he gets drawn into, well, then you'll realize how deeply alarming it was to be told on the Damascus Road that you were daring to fight against God because you thought you could win. I mean, Saul of Tarsus knew very well that he had no chance of winning a fight like that. And the same is true for you and for me. And I want to remind you of that this morning, so please keep a finger in Acts and turn quickly to Romans chapter 5. Let me hear the pages turning. Romans chapter 5. And the reason that we're looking at this, you know that Paul, of course, wrote Romans. The reason we're looking at this is because all of these experiences on the Damascus Road are reflected in what Paul writes elsewhere in his letters. And uh, in Romans chapter 5 and verse 10... Paul says something that he repeats elsewhere many times. He's talking here about our condition before we were converted. And he says this, For if, when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Look at what he says. We were God's enemies. That's what you were before you became a Christian. That's what you are if you're not a Christian this morning. And as someone will say or be thinking in their heart, well, I don't believe that. And of course, most people today don't believe that. They think their friends and neighbors who are not Christians are basically decent people, and they're not against us. They have no real problem with us. But my dear friends, what Paul is saying here is that deep down inside every non-Christian, there is an angry hostility towards God and towards God's people. And the very strange thing, the strange thing is, they themselves might not even be aware of it. Billy Graham uh, used to tell the true story of a time when he was invited to to play in a pro-am golf tournament. And at the end of the round, the professional that he'd been playing with stormed off the course. And he was heard to say, well, I didn't come to play golf to have Billy Graham preach at me. And uh, when somebody passed that message on to Billy Graham and said, well, what on earth did you say? Billy Graham said, well, actually, I didn't mention Christianity or the gospel or Jesus once. In other words, what actually happened was that simply being in Billy Graham's company for a few hours on the golf course brought out the hostility that was inside this man towards God and his people, and he wasn't even aware that was inside him. But you see, deep down inside, there is this basic hostility towards the claims of God in everybody. And strangely enough, you know, it's a very, very good thing when that kind of hostility comes out into the open. Because, you see, there are plenty of non-Christians who will say to you and to me, they have no real problem with Jesus Christ. And then you say to them, perhaps in one-to-one or whatever it is, that Jesus says 
I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. And they hear that, and they really don't like it. They get angry. And so, this is interesting. The reason that Saul's experience on the Damascus Road was so shattering was not because it was a revelation of God, but because it was actually a revelation of himself. He suddenly saw not only that Jesus Christ was alive, but that he, Saul of Tarsus, was fighting against God. Now just imagine what that must have felt like. And it's a deeply alarming thing to discover because, of course, if God fights, God wins. And there can be only one consequence of that, which is judgment, isn't it? That's the first thing. The second thing I want to say about this encounter with Jesus Christ is not only that it was deeply alarming, but it was also a necessary humiliation. Uh, In those days, Pharisees were regarded as extremely religious, extremely respectable, and Saul of Tarsus was one of the most highly regarded of all of them. And so as Saul uh, approaches Damascus, you know, in his heart, he's absolutely confident of his impeccable track record and the rightness of his cause. He's full of pride. And of course, as we know, there's nothing that makes people more proud than religion. But all of a sudden, just in a flash, Saul suddenly realizes that he's not right with God at all. C.S. Lewis has a marvelous chapter on pride in his book, Mere Christianity. And he makes this very helpful comment. He says this, and I quote, How is it that people who are so obviously eaten up with pride can say that they believe in God and appear to be very religious? C.S. Lewis says, I'm afraid it means they are worshipping an imaginary God. Theoretically, they say that they're, uh, they say, oh, I'm nothing in the presence of this imaginary God. But really, all the time, they imagine that he approves of them. And he says, I suppose it means they pay a penny of fake humility to their God, but get back a pound's worth of pride towards their neighbor. Well, that's what happened to Saul of Tarsus. He had to have all of that religious pride knocked out of him. And what a healthy thing that was. You know, how healthy it was for him to suddenly see himself as God saw him, filled with religious self-righteousness, but having absolutely no knowledge of God and no knowledge of Jesus. Now, having said that, I want to finish on a positive note because... It is actually a good thing when God puts us through an experience like this. Because at last, Saul is brought to his senses. For the very first time in his life, he sees things as they really are. So let's let's think about Saul like this. There he is, he's on the road approaching Damascus, And he was thinking about that little group of Christians there and he was thinking about how miserably weak they were. And he's utterly confident, isn't he, that he's going to be able to arrest them and bring them back to Jerusalem without any trouble at all. Now, what does he actually learn about that group of Christians on the Damascus Road? Well, Jesus informs him that in persecuting them, he's actually persecuting Jesus. The union between Christ and that little group of Christians in Damascus is so real, so intimate, that to attack them 
is to attack him. So they're not actually weak after all, are they? They have Christ on their side. You know, over the years, an awful lot of people have discovered this about the Christian church. And yet still the church carries on. I mean, just think about our world today. Think about Kim Jong-un in North Korea. He can't get rid of the church. The Taliban can't get rid of it. Al-Shabaab can't get rid of it. No one's been able to get rid of it. And they never will. So Saul not only discovered that the church was strong when he thought it was weak, but he also discovered that he himself was very weak, although he thought he was super strong. I mean, he had all those letters in his pocket, didn't he, from those important men at the synagogue in Jerusalem. You know, he was their champion persecutor. But where is he at the end of our passage today? He's down in the dust. He's blind, so somebody else has to lead him into the city. And what's he doing when he reaches Damascus? Is he, is he celebrating his amazing encounter with Jesus on the Damascus road? No, he's not. He's on his face before God. He's fasting. He's praying. He's miserable. He finds himself to be a sinner in the hands of an angry God. And as far as he can see, there's only judgment ahead of him. Of course, he couldn't know then, as we know, that just round the corner, there's going to be the grace of God. At this point, all he knows is that all that pride and all that self-righteousness has been crushed out of him for good. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, when we, when we come to our senses, we see just how proud we are, each one of us. And we know that our pride has to be humbled before we can turn to Christ. We thank you for this story of this self-important man being humbled into the dust. And we look forward to next week when we'll see how you showed him your grace. And so we pray that you would teach us through this ancient story and that through it we might hear your voice speaking to us personally. And we ask it through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.